five and a half years ago, in front of the Windspear Center, I was sitting on a curb with Stephen Mandel, literally sitting on a curb, discussing what he thought our city needed over the next five years and what changes were needed if Edmonton Economic Development was going to be a relevant organization in our city's future. And he told me to do three things. Number one, build the best possible organization you can with the best possible people. The second is make, a, make the organization a platform for innovation and big ideas. And third, turn it outward facing so it can be of value to the community and eventually to the region. And as we shook hands to walk away, like Columbo, he looked back and he said, and one more thing, when the day comes, be sure to leave it in better shape than you found it. I value Stephen's advice, always have, always will, which was very different than the advice I received on my first day at EDC when I arrived at my office and sitting on my desk were three envelopes wrapped in a, uh, a bow and on the front of the bow it said, open when you run up against problems you cannot solve. Well, I couldn't help myself, so I opened them right away. <laughs> I opened the first envelope and inside was a cue card that said, blame your predecessor. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> I opened the second one and the cue card said, restructure the company. And finally, I opened the third envelope and the cue card said, prepare three more envelopes for the next person. Well, it's been a wonderful five years. We accomplished exactly what we set out to do. I used all three envelopes at different points along the journey, and I've now prepared three more envelopes for the next CEO. So today, I'd like to do some reflection, uh, some storytelling about brand building, and as always, some navigation about the challenges that still lie ahead. But before I start, I'd like to thank the four former CEOs of EEDC for being a part of today. Everything we accomplished over the past five years was built on the foundation that you built. And each of you were responsible for a leadership era in our city's history. And each of you left our business community better off than which you found it. And we thank you. I'd, al I'd, also, I'd also like to thank Mayor Don Iveson and Edmonton City Council, past and present. As my predecessors can attest to, a key reason an arm's length organization exists is to bring private sector thinking into the public sector to help the public sector achieve their long-term goals. So for giving me the latitude to always put the economy first, for the latitude of building an incredibly persistent team, and for the latitude of operating with a respectful dose of irreverence, Mayor Iveson and Council, we thank you too. Every leadership era is defined by a grand challenge, something that needs to be overcome. When we started on this journey, the challenge was not the low price of oil, the recession, differing political ideologies, or an unstable investment environment. Although all important parts of the journey and stories unto themselves the grand challenge we face and had to overcome was this vulnerable identity and self-esteem of Edmontonians. Why would anyone ever want to be from Edmonton? What's there to do there? Why would you ever want to visit the city, invest there, own a business there, go to school there, live there, die there? We heard all these questions, but as a city, we really didn't have answers. Five years ago in the dead of winter, Edmontonians would go down to Phoenix or Palm Springs or Mexico and they'd arrive at the hotel and the concierge would say, you know, where are you from? And the Edmontonian would say, well, I'm from Edmonton. And the concierge would go, ooh, too bad. And proud Edmontonians would be frustrated because they had no language, stories, and tools to talk about their city, to defend it, to speak positively about it. So they just sink their chins into their chests, avoid eye contact, and quietly walk away. That was our challenge. That was the reaction and the feeling we needed to interrupt and forever overcome. Five years ago, City Council created their economic development plan called The Way We Prosper. 
with tremendous input from the business community who identified goal number one to be a confident and progressive global image. City Council, our shareholder, then tasked EEDC with delivering on that goal, and that goal was really, would define the last five years. And it started early. I was one month into the job when I got called in front of City Council. It was budget time and we were requesting a little bit more money in order to market and position the city globally. And it was Councillor Amarjeet Sohi, his turn to answer question. Now, Federal Minister of Infrastructure Sohi. And he leaned into the mic and he said, Mr. Ferguson, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank Edmonton's brand? And I think that's when, as the, the cheerleader of the city, the CEO of EDC, I probably could have given a safer, a safe answer, and everybody wanted to hear like five, six, seven, eight, maybe. But instead, I decided to speak the truth. I leaned into the mic, and I gave us a score of 1.5 out of 10. A brutal score, but a brutally honest score. But it highlighted the magnitude of work that was still ahead of us and needed to be, needed to be done. At Procter & Gamble, we learned that building a global brand typically takes 10 years and $100 million. Our challenge is we didn't have $100 million, and if we were lucky, we'd have one election cycle of four or five years at best to deliver results. So with that context and $1.5 million from the image and reputation budget, we set out to fundamentally reshape the Edmonton brand from the ground up, starting with a grassroots engagement campaign called Make Something Edmonton, and a five-year goal of having Edmonton starting to appear on lists of national rankings or international rankings, and Edmonton starting to be positioned as one of the exciting cities to watch in the Northern Hemisphere. Most cities launch glossy advertising campaigns, which are expensive, short-lived, and ineffective. With the help of our friend Todd Babiuk, we decided to do something very different. We focused on what we called the seven drivers of economic wealth, foreign investment, new business growth, tourists and visitors, conferences and conventions, major events, talent, students and researchers, and direct flights. And we believed that if we could get all seven aligned to a single brand strategy, we, we could, number one, leverage our marketing dollars and compete as one against bigger cities and with bigger budgets. And second, we could help economic development become a team sport where everyone was engaged and proud and working towards a unified brand. In most cities, these drivers are typically managed by separate organizations that protect their territories and rarely get along. And we were lucky. With EEDC's conglomerate structure, we saw the opportunity to create a platform and a team approach to brand building and to align the seven economic drivers through what we call a bowling pin strategy, where we would build the Edmonton brand up by knocking down one pin at a time and eventually turn the 1.3 million people in the Edmonton metro region into our collective marketing department. And wherever we went, whatever we did, with every story we told, people started seeing their story as part of the Edmonton story the Make Something Edmonton story. And no matter where you came from or what you were trying to do, whether you were wanting to build North America's first mosque or its first food bank or a new festival or the highest ranked cycling race ever before in Canada, whether you wanted to build a video game company or a protocol for an islet cell transplant, an outdoor yoga studio, downtown arena, or the smartest pipelines in the world, your stories, our stories, all centered around one common theme, and that is if you are willing to take a risk, if you have the courage to take an idea to reality, to build, to make something, Edmonton was your city. And we told that story over and over for five straight years. The first bowling pin was the entrepreneurs a very identifiable group belonging to places like Startup Edmonton and Tech Edmonton, EO, YPO, along with everyone working in garages or co-working co spaces that were doing some amazing things, but they had never celebrated their entrepreneurism together. 
So we celebrated them. We told their stories when the media was starving for good content. We put on conferences and we got this a very identifiable group of young CEOs and their staff engaged with their city. And it worked. Our entrepreneurs started shifting the Edmonton brand from an industrial brand to an entrepreneurial brand in a very short period of time. From there, we launched the consumer brand, Explore Edmonton. Under the leadership of Maggie Davison, we took the same brand essence that built and built a 52-week calendar of festivals and events such that we could give every person from Fort McMurray, Fort St. John, Grand Prairie, Cold Lake, Saskatoon, Regina, Lloydminster, Red Deer, all those within 400 kilometers radius, a reason to visit Edmonton four times a year, stay three nights per visit, and spend $350 a day, which would give us not the sexiest, but one of the most lucrative tourism markets in Canada. And it would create a rhythm and an energy and a pace in our city that we had never seen before. We brought in journalists and bloggers to experience our city and write articles about our food scene, fashion scene, art scene, entertainment scene, and publish them around the world. But to visit, to build itineraries, we needed some major events. So that was our next bowling pin. Edmonton had some great festivals and events, but we as a community needed to make Edmonton a great winter city. We targeted the Red Bull Crashed Ice event. And with the city of Edmonton's support, we had the courage to wrap the track around this Shaw Conference Center so participants could be televised around the world plunging into our river valley with Edmonton's skyline as the backdrop. We, ta we targeted 18 to 34 year olds as they were our future labor force, taxpayers and baby makers, and they came in droves. We had over 70,000 below the riverbank, 20,000 on Jasper Avenue, and 5,000 in Churchill Square, all helping Edmonton become a great winter city and helping drive new interest in outdoor events like the Flying Canoe Volant, Nuit Blanche, and the Deep Freeze Festival. The excitement around our consumer brand allowed us, in partnership with Edmonton Destination Marketing Hotels and the City of Edmonton, to go after bigger events and to be the host city for events I assume you all remember, like FIFA Women's World Cup, the ITU World Triathlon, FIS, and the Tour of Alberta. Large-scale, outdoor, mostly free events that allowed us, but especially 18 to 34-year-olds, emotionally connect with their city to be proud of their city and to send new images and pictures of our city that had never been seen before all over the world with pride. The next bowling pin was one that was long overdue. An integrated conference and convention center strategy for our city, finally bringing Edmonton's two major convention centers under a single leadership and management model. It took four years a number of board meetings, and a lot of courage by city council. But as of January 1st, we are now able to market our city's conference and convention space as one team with one voice under one banner and without undercutting each other. It's a huge breakthrough for our city. Over the past three months, we've successfully welcomed 80 full-time and 611 part-time staff from the Edmonton Expo Center to the EDC family. And I would like to thank Edmonton City Council for having the trust in us to deliver, and to my friend Tim Reed for the many late night discussions, the occasional scotch, and the commitment for us to always remain friends throughout the negotiation process. Our economic brand positions Edmonton now as a key place for foreign and domestic investment, and a brand that helps Edmonton based companies export and find distribution channels in new markets. In 2015, under the leadership of Glenn Vanstone, we launched Invest in Edmonton Region, where we told the stories, the same brand stories, but of companies that either took the risk and invested here and were met with unparalleled success, or companies that came from here and were now exporting all over the world. Companies like Cywin Foods and Sunterra, who have now doubled their volume into Asia market over the last three years, or companies like Progressive Foods and Pure Botan Botanicals, who are now exporting to Japan for the first time, and so many more. Our export stories 
allowed us to position Edmonton as a progressive thinking distribution hub. And we had some big wins, like attracting HelloFresh, who selected Edmonton as their Western Canadian distribution center for ready-made meals. And of course, Aurora Cannabis and Canopy Growth, the two largest medicinal marijuana manufacturers in the world, who chose Edmonton and the Edmonton metro region as their Western Canadian home. These new industries and new sectors are attractive to that 18 to 34 year old market and they complement the excitement in our technology sector where we told high growth stories coming out of companies like Jobber and Granify, BioWare, GiffyCat, Yardstick, Intuit, Shobi and Sam which grabbed the attention of venture capital and private equity funds across North America or Google DeepMind's decision to pick Edmonton as their first North American location. These companies and stories I'm talking about now join the traditional stories of PCL and Stantec and The Running Room, the Canadian Western Bank, Gilead, The Brick, that we tell all over the world. Building our economic brand and our success overseas could not have been possible without the support of two people. Minister Darren Billis of the Government of Alberta and Dylan Jones, Deputy Minister for Western Economic Diversification and the Government of Canada. And I would like to thank them for their leadership. Because together, we worked to design a program that would double our efforts in foreign markets, and Glenn Vanstone and his trade and investment team were able to produce double, more than double the results for our city and our region. So we'd like to thank you. The journey we've all been on in the last five years has changed our trajectory forever. And when you change your trajectory, you get noticed a little bit along the way. Canadian Geographic magazine voted us Canada's top winter city. National Geographic listed us as one of the top summer places to visit. And we're listed as one of Travel and Leisure magazine's top 50 destinations in the world for 2018. And Airbnb last month now lists Edmonton as their third highest global growth destination. Edmonton is ranked number nine amongst the top 10 global sports city, ahead of Melbourne, which I always thought was the competition, and right between Tokyo and New York. And our culinary food team and food scene was frequently recognized, with Air Canada awarding three of their top 10 restaurant honors to us in 2017. That little bowling pin strategy was working and we were all on our way to achieving a confident and progressive global brand. And then the phone rang. It was October 21st, this past year, and the call was from the head of Resonance Consulting, a global firm that ranks the world's best cities and the world's best city brands based on six detailed attributes, place, product, programming, people, prosperity, and promotion. This is the holy grail of our industry the list that everybody wants to be on. They never ranked Edmonton before, but we knew that they saw us win the Place Branding Award in London in 2016, and they saw us do a keynote address in New York in 2017, and we knew that there was growing interest. When the phone rang to let us know that we were on this year's list, we were delighted, but we actually went into damage control. No, seriously, we went into damage control, thinking the first year we'd surely be number 98, 99, or 100, and our critics would be all over for us for not doing our job. But then the next morning, at 10 a.m. our time, 5 p.m. in London, the list came out, and there we were debuting at number 60, right between Bangkok and New Orleans, the perfect spot for Edmonton. Five years of effort, 1.3 million people in our marketing department, and this, folks, this was a big day for your city and the entire Edmonton region. It is key for us to understand that the rankings didn't judge us on a single slogan or ad campaign. Instead, they judged us on who we are as Edmontonians, a unique collection of people on this particular bend of the North Saskatchewan River on the sum of all our parts. Those from away who come here and write about us or assess us to rank us see something special, even though we don't always see it in ourselves sometimes. At EDC, 
Every member of our team believes it's time for Edmontonians to embrace our collective story with pride, with confidence, and maybe even with a little swagger. Maybe through something like this. This is a city of grit and love. A work hard, play hard kind of place. We get up early. Man, it can be so dark. But that's what we got to do to compete. If you're born with a silver spoon or want to sit on the beach all day, this probably isn't your kind of place. People here work hard, study hard, work out hard, hurry hard, cheer hard. I moved here in 2017, 1999, 1984, 1978, 1945, 1927. People come here because of opportunity to start their lives to restart their lives, to own a house, my little piece of paradise, to start a business, to start a family. But we all stay here because we are part of building something, a community, a city, not New York or Toronto or Calgary, definitely not Calgary. We're building a city that is weaved together with different colors and shapes and sizes. Like a medley, a soup, yeah, like turkey soup. We're the festival city, river city, Alberta's capital city, gateway to the north, a college town, a government town, a sports town, volunteer town, city of champions, definitely champions. Always champions. I wouldn't live anywhere else. As we look forward to the year ahead, there's much to be excited about and an equal amount to be nervous about. The overall economy is experiencing an uptick, but interest rates are now falling close behind. The price of oil is above $62, but local producers of Western Canadian Select are still getting $25 a barrel less. Our rig count is back to pre-recession levels, but profits down the value chain have yet to follow. Unemployment is starting to come back, now down to 7.5%, but Edmonton's unemployment rate is still 32% higher than the Canadian average. Regardless of those ups and downs, our private sector businesses are marching forward. We have more Edmonton-based companies than ever before selling into China, India, Japan, Korea. We have more Edmonton-based companies than ever before investing in new technologies. We have five condo towers and two hotels looking to put a shovel in the ground. A group, uh, and groups like Edmonton.ai wanting to be, uh, create 100 artificial intelligence companies in the next two years. That's one company a week who will help fill our surrounding office towers as they grow and expand. We also have tech companies graduating out of Startup Edmonton and the TELUS T-squared incubator every month. Healthcare companies to be graduated out of the Merck Accelerator at Tech Edmonton and a new cannabis incubator coming on stream in the months ahead. The low Canadian dollar continues to be a boon to our exporters and will continue to drive tourism to our region. We have another Red Bull crashed ice coming in early March. Tom Ruth and our partners from EIA have a new daily direct flight to San Francisco on Air Canada starting May 1st. And of course, Len Rhodes and his team will be bringing home the 106th Grey Cup in late November. But if you think we can just walk into the next five years thinking the world's your oyster, thinking we can just sit back and enjoy the ride, you're gravely disappointed. Growth opportunities will be hard to find and the competition has never been as fierce. Growth will require a new level of risk that will make many existing businesses uncomfortable. Growth will require investment in new technologies, new mar people, new markets, and new programming languages like Lisp or Prolog or Python. And that's traditionally been uncomfortable territory for many of our business owners. And where we rely on great advisory firms like Deloitte, our sponsor today, to help navigate their path forward. 
The new normal will be anything but static. It will be fiercely competitive, competing against every other city on that top 100 list with lower cost structures, lower tax rates, less regulations, faster approval processes, better demographics, more density, better market access, more direct flights, or higher levels of hunger that accompany their entrepreneurism. And that will bring about a test for our city. As the price of oil is driven higher and higher by emerging market demand and geopolitical instability will restrict supply even more, the question ahead for Edmonton is will we choose to play as a confident and progressive top city, 60 city in the world from here forward? Or will we go back to our complacent ways when the next oil boom starts, which is likely to be within the next 12 months? Regardless of the price of oil, if the world GDP is growing at 3.4%, then we need to be growing at 4% in order to be gaining market share. And gaining market share needs to be our collective mindset. If gaining market share is our collective mindset, and Edmonton is growing at 4% a year, it's amazing how it changes how we talk, how we plan, how we make decisions. If companies and our population and our GDP is growing at 4% a year, that would double the size of Edmonton in less than 20 years. What if we told that to the world? What if we told that to Air Canada? What if we told that to North, Nordstrom's or Red Bull or Google? 4% is a mindset. Gaining market share is a mindset. Being the capital city of Alberta is a mindset. Overtaking Calgary to become Canada's fourth largest city is a mindset. People want to be part of something that's exciting, that's growing, that's winning. People want to be a part of a city that's rising in the rankings, home to the top university in the country, the best hockey team in the NHL, and the greatest opportunities for our youth. A 4% mindset changes the way we do projects, finance projects, and the timelines in which we complete projects, because we need to get those people and that capital freed up to start working on the next project. It's a mindset. It changes how we think about density and transportation and parking. It changes how we do procurement. And it changes the way we use technology, because everything we do needs to be smarter, faster, and cheaper than we do today, and much better than it's ever been done before. For five years, I've stood at this podium talking about complacency, technology change, emerging market change, demographic change, environmental change, and the need to put ideological differences aside and achieve compromise in order to grow, not spend or cut, but grow our way out of the current economic predicament. I understand that sometimes these ideas are uncomfortable, but I took this role with the goal of increasing the prosperity of wealth and wealth of Edmontonians increasing and investing in the initiatives that grow our economy, improving our competitiveness, and building the Edmonton brand, and I will always challenge those initiatives and policies that do otherwise in this role or the next. It's nice having a five-year plan and an end date, as it motivates you to get things done. In, in that time, we doubled the size of EEDC. We took a budget of $32 million and grew it to where it is next year, it'll be almost $70 million. We now employ over 1,100 people. Our work delivered almost $200 million in economic impact last year, up from $126 million in four years earlier when we first started measuring impact. That's a 9x return on every city of Edmonton tax dollar we receive, all while reducing our reliance on the city of Edmonton tax dollars and the tax levy from 48% where we started to what will be 25% next year. Five years ago, my chief operating officer, Derek Hudson, and I set out to redefine what an economic development agency is capable of doing. We brought in an, uh, an entrepreneurial culture and set out to accomplish what that former mayor on the curb challenged us to do, to build an organization that had the strategy, knowledge, process, tools, and culture to compete and win. Our board members, over the last five years, gave us the courage and the encouragement to go make you, the community, proud. And through the process, we created an organization that is now considered to be one of Canada's most admired corporate cultures. It's been an incredible journey. The executive team we built 
The people on the screen deserve so much credit as they are the best team I could have ever asked to be a part of. We've laughed together, we've cried together many times. We've experienced the full economic cycle, political cycle and relationship cycle that comes with the work we do, the highs and the lows. But every single day, these people and the 1,100 people that work alongside them get up every morning knowing they've been given a unique responsibility, a responsibility to build a city that is truly remarkable. The EDC that is here today is better than we found it, and I can proudly say that you, the business community, are in very good hands. It's been my absolute pleasure to serve, and I thank you very much. Thank you.